Hey, hey, this is Cedric Youngelman, your host of the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. Today's episode with reformed hedge fund manager James Lavish is brought to you by Alpa Energy Bars, a new kind of energy bar. Live life untamed. Question everything. If you don't believe everything you're told, break the rules, strive for freedom, reach for your peak, and don't follow the mainstream, then you're one of us. We question everything everything, including what real health is. Alpa bars are made with high quality Colorado grass fed beef, American sourced fruits and nuts and nutrient rich beef tallow packed with nutrients, 327 calories, 27 grams of fat, 14 grams of protein and six grams of carbs for a single Alpa apex bar. Alpa bars currently come in three flavors, blueberry almond, cranberry pecan, and Apex, the Chad of energy bars, challenging the norm and supporting freedom. Use the link in the show notes or go to eatalpa.com now and use the code matrix for 5% off your purchase of Alpa premium energy meat bars. Plus get another 5% off your order when you pay in Bitcoin. This episode is also brought to you by River, the best place to stack sats and build your Bitcoin wealth. Invest in Bitcoin with confidence. Securely buy Bitcoin with 100% full reserve custody and zero fees on recurring orders. Your Bitcoin is your Bitcoin. Unlike other exchanges, River builds security into every product and service for your peace of mind. This is where the Bitcoiners are going for a new standard in Bitcoin. Use the link in the show notes to get started and get $5 free in Bitcoin when you sign up today. Up next... I'm proud to announce new sponsor, Thea. Step into the world of secure Bitcoin multi-sig with Thea, where simplicity meets security. Overwhelmed with complex hardware wallets, Thea is here to change that. Their two of three keys multi-sig vaults are not just secure, but incredibly easy to use. Say goodbye to lost seed phrases damaged hardware keys, and hello to simple and secure mobile-friendly Bitcoin multi-sig. Your Bitcoin deserves the best protection. With Thea, you're in charge. No more fears of losing your keys or falling prey to hackers. Their self-custody multi-sig vault empowers you to be the ultimate guardian of your Bitcoin. And for those unexpected moments, Thea's got your back. Their multi-device vaults with both assisted and sovereign recovery options mean your Bitcoin is safe, always accessible, and ready for the future. Share the power of secure Bitcoin with your loved ones. Thea enables shared custody, making it a family-friendly choice for safeguarding your digital legacy. Thea is more than an app. It's your partner in the Bitcoin journey with 24-7 support from a team that cares. Download Thea now using the link in the show notes, which will get you your first six months for free and experience a new standard in Bitcoin multi-sig security. Hodler's Official is the team Bitcoin merch and memorabilia company for Bitcoin's biggest fans. Think of them this Black Friday and for the holiday season. Their first team Bitcoin jersey collection is appropriately named the Genesis Collection commemorating January 3rd, 2009 the day Satoshi mined the Bitcoin Genesis block, featuring the 09 number on the back with Satoshi on the name bar. This is a limited edition set. Only 2,100 jerseys from this Genesis collection will ever exist, and I already have mine. You may have also seen them online or at a bunch of Bitcoin conferences this year. Super high quality, sharp design, fits nice and true to size. Great gift ideas for your friends and family that love Bitcoin. Go to hodlersofficial.com today and get your team Bitcoin gear. Use the code MATRIX for 10% off your entire purchase. This episode is also brought to you by new sponsor of the Bitcoin Matrix podcast, the Florida Beef Initiative, where the richness of Florida's ranching heritage meets the unstoppable force of Bitcoin. Circle Six Ranch has proudly partnered with the Beef Initiative and Bitcoin Bay to enrich local economies and revolutionize food supply chains to offer you a taste of Beefmaster Black Angus beef that's grass-fed, antibiotic-free, and steeped in tradition. Discover their premium beef selections like the Florida Pasture Beef Box and join a movement that's restoring Florida's local economy one steak at a time. Visit floridabeefinitiative.com forward slash discount forward slash matrix to be a part of the change. 
Link for a discount can also be found in the show notes. The Florida Beef Initiative and Bitcoin Matrix Energy Secured with exceptional flavor. Also, you can pay with Bitcoin and invest in community with every succulent bite. Finally, at the Bitcoin Advisor, I'm now here to help clients with their multi-sig setup to buy and secure real Bitcoin for decades to come while ensuring you can sleep at night with the right estate planning and asset protection strategies to make sure your Bitcoin is safe for you and your family. I'm here to help get your Bitcoin off exchanges, simplify the process, address your Bitcoin challenges, and ensure you feel confident every step of the way. If you or someone you know needs help buying Bitcoin and creating a multi-sig vault, I'm here to help. Ready to dive in and learn more? Simply head over to the bitcoinadvisor.com forward slash Cedric and book some time on my calendar. I'm more than happy to hop on a call and see how I can help. And now, Let's enter the Bitcoin matrix for this fun rip with James Lavish, where he breaks down in a very simplified manner what the F is going on in the U.S. economy, treasury markets, how the government operates, what exactly is a debt spiral, is the U.S. already in one, and finally, are sports a waste of time and an encouraging and motivating rundown of the 17 most important lessons that have carried James throughout his career and life. What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. James Lavish is the CFA of the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund. The former hedge fund manager has 25 years of institutional investment and risk management experience. For the past 15 years, the Yale and Cornell alum and former NHL draft pick was the chief operating officer and risk manager of LKCM Alternative Management LLC, a hybrid public and private equity hedge fund unit, investing in a wide range of industries and market capitalization of both public and private companies. Prior to joining LKCM, James was the co-founder and managing partner of Ranger Arbitrage, a global risk arbitrage hedge fund. From 1998 to 2003, James was head arbitrage trader and served as an officer on the compliance committee for Carlson Capital, a $4 billion global multi-strategy hedge fund. Earlier in his career, James worked in risk and ADR arbitrage for Citigroup and SG Warburg, where he began his career as a trader on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. He is the author of the Informationist Newsletter and a co-founder of the Economic and Bitcoin Education Group, The Looking Glass. James Lavish, welcome to the Bitcoin Matrix Podcast. How are you? <laughs> that all sounded like I have a ton of experience. I'm super important. But uh, the, tr- the truth is, <laughs> I feel like I've just been in the trenches of finance for the last 30 years. So, but I am, uh, I'm good. It's it's great to be here. It's evening where I am. Uh, it's five o'clock, which... You know, sometimes I'm doing these podcasts, it's uh, it's six o'clock in the morning and the sun's not up. Now it's five o'clock at night and the sun's not up. So we're uh, kind of doing the barbell strategy here, Cedric. I hear you. <laughs> but, no, burning the candle on both ends, uh, trying to get a lot done. Yeah, Time it's is a... to, yeah, it's good to be here, though. I'm glad to finally uh, get to talk to you over uh, over the air. So yeah, I would love the content. Me. Yeah, no, yeah. thank you for coming on. I love the content you've been putting out, especially in the newsletter and on Twitter and uh, at conferences. So I'd love to kind of go back to maybe where it all started. Uh, Cause you know, being in the trenches for 25 plus years, I'm sure you've seen a lot, uh, but everyone lives a life before their career. So when did you start playing hockey? I, I know you're from upstate New York. I went to college mm-hmm. in SUNY Albany and oh, okay. I grew up near the New York Islanders on Long Island. Uh, I was pretty young when they won four in a row. Uh, so when did you start playing hockey and what was it like growing up in upstate New York? Well, I grew up right around the corner from you. Uh, so I grew up in in a little sleepy little town uh, north of Albany called Clifton Park. And so uh, when I was very young, my my dad was a baseball player. And uh, back in the day, he he played uh, down in the city. He was he was from uh, New York City. He was down in the Lower East Side when it was. Before it was Alphabet City, there were like uh, there were just small Ukrainian Russian projects down there, and that's where he was from. So, uh, but he, when we moved upstate, 
there was an opportunity to to play hockey like everybody else did up there. I mean, there's so much snow. It was always icy. It's cold. And uh, so I started skating when I was like four years old. Um, so and right there is the it was uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, RPI, which is a great engineering college right around the corner from uh, SUNY Albany in Schenectady. And so I, I grew up as a boy watching them play and and I saw them win the national championship, the NCAA championship. And I saw, of course, being near Lake Placid, uh, I got to see the United States win the Olympics uh, in, in ice hockey back in 1980. And so that was, those are all kind of building blocks to my dream of being a an, an Olympic hockey player and a professional hockey player, kind of all added up. And, and then, so I played for many years. Sure. So how big are, are- big part of your identity was hockey and what was it like playing at Yale it was I mean back then it was uh, almost all of it truly uh, I mean that that in those days uh well I, in those days you didn't you didn't play just one sport you played all of them right so I played soccer football hockey baseball I played all of them all the way up until high school but when I chose hockey as my as my focus sport in high school it was it was a pretty big deal um and so it became quite a bit of my identity especially after i got drafted by uh, the boston bruins i mean i thought cedric might even going into yale which they don't have athletic scholarships but let's be honest that was what i brought to the table to go to yale and so you have to have some sort of exceptional ability or uh, or gift or something. And mine was, I was going to help their hockey team. And so, uh, but I went to Yale with the idea that uh, in, in I would play hockey there for four years and it, the NHL is different than the other major leagues. They don't, they don't typically take a, take a kid who's 18, draft them and bring them right into the pros they'll draft them at 18, let them go play for a few years, whether it's in juniors up in Canada or it's for a college. And then they'll, uh, then they'll bring them in. And so I had the full expectation that I would go into their system, the Boston Bruins system, and hopefully get into the NHL pretty quickly after college. Uh, It was a pretty big part of my identity. So to shortcut your your next question is uh, I, when I graduated Right when I was graduating, I, I thought that I was going to go play. And some of the, your listeners may have heard these stories before. And uh, But in, in short, I was on the U.S. national team. There was a, it, They had about twice as many players as they were going to take to the Olympics. And so I was on that uh, in that roster. And so I was playing in tournaments and I was doing that. And then I was drafted by Boston. My agent was kind of negotiating out what the terms would be. And I... And senior year, right in the middle of my uh, career at Yale, everything's going great. I think um, this is, you know, my my I'm playing with at the time the top the leading score of all time from Yale, my center, uh, and uh, and so we we were flying high. We were we were ranked in the nation. We we thought every, everything was working perfectly, and then as it happens, I I just uh, regular game senior year I took a funny hit and my skate got caught in a groove in the ice and snapped my medial collateral and my ACL. Um, And so, and I, and I just never recovered from that. And it was pretty much over in an instant. I, I, I could never get back to where I was. And so my identity evaporated. I everything I thought, everything I envisioned, every everywhere I thought I was going, kind of blew, just blew up in smoke uh, in in an instant. The good news is that my my father was in; he was uh, adamant that I was going to go and get a good education somewhere, whether it was going to be at RPI or someplace like Yale, where I was fortunate enough to get into. And so, yeah, I did have a I had a degree. People laugh now because you come out of those institutions, you come out of those, uh, those schools, those universities or colleges with a degree. And it's not a degree that is really obviously 
applicable in anything unless you get a business degree, unless you go and do graduate work and get a law degree, or you go and get a medical uh, degree. So I came out with a political science degree and I didn't really know what I was going to do. Uh, now, when when you leave a school like that, the expectation is when you graduate from a school like that, the expectation is that you've learned over the course of those years how to uh, how to critically think, how to step into a situation, uh, figure it out very quickly, have an have an opinion or uh, a kind of have a thought process around it that would be applicable and valuable. And, and so that was what I was, I was hanging on that hope that somebody would recognize I, I had the ability to learn quickly. Unfortunately, I, I went through a series of, of interviews. It was in New York city. The long story short is I had been, I had been effectively traded to uh, the New York Rangers and tried out for that team I was nowhere near where I was going to have to be to be on that team uh, physically anymore. And so, and quite honestly, that team was exceptional. <laughs> it was so good. They went on to win the Stanley Cup. You remember you growing up there and being an Islander fan, um, likely, right? You're an Islander fan? Huge Islander fan. But so that's the one sport I'm, I'm on the same page with my dad, who was a huge Ranger fan, uh, born in yeah. Brooklyn. and. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he was a fan of hockey before the honors were around. So I used to chant 1940 in his face all the time up until 1994 when, when Messier <laughs> brought the cup home. Right. Well, and then, I mean, you know, so Garth Snow is one of the guys I played with on the, on the uh, national team and against when he was at University of Maine. Uh, he played up there in, in the Islanders, right? So anyway, uh, I, I bumped around, asked some of my friends some of the people who i i had known in college what they were doing and they were history majors english majors and they were all on wall street and i was and i was i was kind of surprised by that i didn't realize that that was the path to get on just to get into that world and the path was not to you did there was no business degree at yale you could have studied economics which i which i basically minored in economics there uh i had to make a choice there was a dual degree and that's what i was going for and then they took it away in the middle of my um, yale career so i had to make a choice i had more credits already in political science i finished out there but i still took some uh econ anyway so uh yeah i i got i i was fortunate enough to to get introduced some people that were looking for young uh, graduates to start a, a new program at, at SG Warburg. And I, I got hired. And my first job, as you detailed, was a, a clerk as a clerk on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And so that means that I was doing anything from uh, actually helping trade ADR arbitrage on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange to getting coffee for the senior clerks and the traders on the floor. And so that was my first job, kind of a baptism by fire, dropped into the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. It looked exactly like it it, it does in the movie uh, Wall Street, the first movie. It's uh, where it's just absolute chaos. It's yelling. It's madness. There's paper flying everywhere. And uh, it's intense. That's what it was like back then. And so, yeah, that was my first job um, coming out of coming out of college. Well, that's awesome. Uh, I want to break down a little bit here. So, you know, I've met some other Yale athletes um, and it's almost like an academic army, what Yale puts out there, because um, the, the people I've met are uh, exceptional athletes, but then go on to do exceptional things outside of athletics mm -hmm. uh, beyond uh, Yale, whether it's Wall Street or Hollywood uh, producing movies or things like that. And so I'm kind of curious. And, and what, I, what I also find is a lot of student athletes or just athletes in general are yearning whether they end up finding this or not, like to be in a career that reminds them of sports, maybe like being in the moment, something fast twitch, something that's, you yeah. know, you, you live in the moment, you think and you react and, and you play on uh, and you have other players. So uh, I'm wondering what it was like for you to transform yourself into a hedge fund manager. Uh, Cause you know, there are different ways to be in finance, whether it's FP and a, and maybe you're a spreadsheet jockey uh, and maybe you go to weekly update meetings, very different from being on the New York stock exchange floor and being a trader in the pit. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's a really good uh, point. 
And for me, so some of my friends uh, who were not hockey players, uh, they, some were football players and, uh, you know, and, and they did some various things, but some of them went into the investment banking side, which was a lot slower twitch, very intense, uh, long working hours and uh, and some pre some pretty uh, good pressure for that for that age. Uh, but for me, I stepped onto the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. It was it was almost exactly like being stepping right back out onto the ice. It was super fast paced. It was very high intensity. Uh, you had to work really quickly with people around you. Um, and uh, and it was really it was kind of like I had a coach uh, who at Union College uh, who used to say uh, his his mantra was read. It, it would be read, react, adjust, read, react, adjust, read, react, adjust. And that's kind of the way it was down there. And it and it wasn't as much. And, and, it, and this kind of carries through my entire career. It wasn't as much um, about how what decision I made. It was almost more important how I reacted to the outcome of that decision. And so, and what I did, did I, did I double down? Did I, was I stubborn? Did I recognize where I was wrong? Where, how much discipline do you have around your decision-making? And that, that was a really important, very quick lesson. Another quick lesson I learned was just surrounding yourself with people who are smarter than you. I mean, I was, I was quickly surrounded by people who had so much experience and, and knowledge and, yeah, so they didn't go to Yale. They didn't go to uh, Dartmouth or Harvard. Who cares? They were so knowledgeable and they were so intelligent. They were they were street smart. They were incredible traders. Uh, and uh, and I learned a, a, a massive amount from them. And so it was a pretty good, it was an easy way for me to just transition from the ice to a professional life where you imagine, you think, oh God, I, I'm no longer, I thought I was going to be, in the NHL or AHL, and I was going to be on a team. I was going to be in front of a crowd. And I was going to be playing this game. It was going to be fun. I would get up and practice. I would have dinner, dinner with my team or whatever it was. And then all of a sudden, no, you're going to be behind a desk somewhere, staring at a computer screen or staring at documents all day long, every day. The thought of that would have been excruciating for me. So it made it very easy for me to just go into a, it was a, a high kinetic kind of environment where there's a lot of movement and energy and it felt quite a bit the same and the intensity and you're competing. And so it's no surprise that I fell into the world of arbitrage, which was back then it wasn't spreadsheets and models and modeling and risk modeling. It was you literally had a calculator and my calculator wasn't even as nice as this one. You just had a calculator, which had big buttons on it. So you could make the, you can make the adjustment or you could make calculations quickly. It was just how quick can you do it? Come up with an answer and go. And um, so it was, it, it was an easy actual, actually it was an easy transition for me in that sense. My identity had been completely uh, it just evaporated and I had to build a, a new one. Uh, luckily I was, I was pretty good at math and I could take a lot of that, a lot of that knowledge from sports, as you're saying, and apply it in this world. And so it was, it was easy. Yeah, that's great. And we're going to get into a lot of that a little bit later in the show, but I remember growing up. So I grew up outside of wall street in the suburbs of long Island of New York city. I, I was always fascinated by sort of economic topics and, uh, thinking about money and things like that. But I, I specifically remember I was I'm a little younger than you, but I remember Black Monday in 87. Mm -hmm. I think that was before you hit the street. It was my, but, I was in high school. Yeah, I remember that day. Yeah. A lot of my um, see, I was at I was at a a, a, a um, boarding school playing hockey and I was surrounded by some pretty wealthy people. I mean, we did. <laughs> my dad was a nuclear engineer, but that that mean, meant he was working basically for Navy Nuclear. He, we were not wealthy, uh, but I remember people, kids, walking around and worried about their parents because of the just the damage that had been done that day and the wreckage financially. Um, and there was some. I of course I could not relate at all. Uh, all I saw was this world that I had no knowledge of. And I, I couldn't even I couldn't even imagine what it would be like to have 
a, pen, a penthouse on Park Avenue where some of these kids did. That was just unfathomable for me. But they were deeply depressed when that happened. And I I was just kind of observed it from the outside, not really understanding it fully. So, but go ahead. Sorry, Senator. No, no problem. I, I mean, my parents were public school teachers, so we didn't grow up wealthy at all either. But, uh, you know, and my parents didn't take the train back and forth from work, but the neighborhood, a lot of had people commuted to New York and worked down the street or in Manhattan. And you could feel the malaise and you saw it on the front page of the of the news, of the newspapers. And, uh, but I didn't understand it fully, but I was excited by the idea of people who were really impacted by it, the largest people. I was like, wow, they're players in this. And uh, I, I, I kind of was interested in the allure of, of being, of having cards in that game, uh, of being able to like give advice and, and be heard or, or contribute in a positive manner in those situations. That was really interesting to me. But then fast forward to 1997 or 98, I was wrapping up college studying finance and LTCM long-term capital management happened. It's so funny. I just, I had picked this up recently to start reading it again. Uh, the when genius failed for anybody who has not read that that's uh, Roger Lowenstein, but that's, that's the story. Yeah. And you were working in the markets that day, maybe not, you know, focused on what LTCM was doing, but what was the atmosphere? Like here you are, you're we in actually, the game. We actually were. We were doing so. I was I was trading risk arbitrage, and that was a big part of their. They had a big, a very large arbitrage book, merger and risk arbitrage book. For your listeners who aren't aware of this, who don't know, that basically it's an arbitrage for mergers that have been announced. So this is not like Ivan Bosky, uh, Michael Milken days, where they were in like there was a rampant insider trading on knowledge about deals. This is this this is just a mathematical. Um, kind of approach to it that if this security is going to turn into this security because of uh, because of a, an announced merger, well, you can arbitrage where they're trading in the markets. And so if the merger closes, those collapse and turn into each other, basically, and you can collect the arbitrage between them. So I was doing that. Well, long-term capital management, these guys were doing that too in big size huge size, but they were doing a lot of other stuff too. So um, imagine I'm at a hedge fund called Carlson Capital down in Fort Worth, Texas. And we're sitting in, in little, you know, in this, in a building in, in one of the called the Bass Towers and we're the Bass family, uh, the Bass brothers built kind of Sundance Square there. And we're sitting there. I can't remember the floors, 26th or 30th floor or something like that. And it's, uh, and it's late at night one day, and we're just watching the markets in our markets kind of melt down. And we know there's a big player who's in trouble. We don't know exactly what's going on, but we know there's something going on. At the time, that hedge fund was, I, wouldn't, I want to say it was about $700 billion that we had under management, which was not very big. I mean, it was big, but it was not very big uh, for the landscape of, of hedge funds. However, we had great relationships across the street, and, and one of the largest hedge funds in the world was in Dallas. We got a call from them and the one of the managing directors there, he was like, hey, do you guys have exposure to uh to Goldman? And so um we we're and we did not uh we had some counterparty risk with with swaps and derivatives, but we we weren't using them as a prime broker. Um but they said well if you have any counterparty risk, I would get out of it tonight because they're going under. And so we were kind of on the inside line there, we knew that there was something going on that the head of Goldman was meeting with the, with the head of the New York Fed, and they were trying to iron out some sort of rescue plan. And so what had happened is these, they were, they were basically for all intents and purposes, long-term capital management was, they were basically short volatility around bonds. And as, as bond spreads had blown out, I'm just, I'm oversimplifying it for everybody, but as bond spreads blew out, their their trades that they were levered on, they got margin called on. And so now you remember that uh, you think of back in 2007, where people were highly levered personally with, with the homes they were buying and and how many mortgages they had out with flexible with you know flexible um, variable interest rate mortgages well these guys were doing something in in interest rate arbitrage where they were levered as much as a hundred times to one in these trades 
And in fact, the, the, the best estimate is that they, they had a billion dollars under management and they had about a hundred billion dollars worth of positions. And so as these things started blowing up, it threatened to take down not just them and some of their investors that had money with them and some of the counterparties, but it threatened to take down major investment banks. And if it had taken down Goldman, it would have been catastrophic for the street. And so the New York Fed came in and engineered kind of a rescue for them to make sure that they didn't fail. And uh, and so that was there was that was a pretty big wake up call for me. I was a I was just a few years in and now heading up an arbitrage desk, uh, trading desk at Carlson Capital. And I was it was uh, it was ba another baptism by fire. And man, risk happens fast, as Greg Foss likes to say. And we actually he and I talk about long term capital management quite a bit because it was a it was an it was very uh, impactful to our our knowledge and our careers. Yeah, I found it very impactful as well. Just to my academic studies, we spent a lot of time discussing it. And uh, I remember just coming away from it very jaded. Um, it was the first time I saw like a rescue plan put in place uh, for the losers, essentially. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you, think, if you think about it, so if you go back, it actually starts in 1987, right? With the, Alan Greenspan comes in and Black Monday and the market app, it just is decimated. And he steps in and he and he uh, kind of, he placates the market. He said, look, we're going to do whatever we need to, to make sure that this market doesn't collapse. We've got your back. And that was like, oh, and so everybody, so they, banks were turning, they're like, okay, with the, okay, we're okay. And so that led up to that 1998 situation, which again, they got bailed out, which leads to the 2000 tech bubble, which then leads to that the bailout there is, it wasn't really a bailout, but that that kind of set the stage that if the if if the markets can't collapse, really 1998 was the major stepping stone there where it was, okay, not 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 just words now. We're actually going to step in and help engineer a a rescue, even though it's not as though the Fed printed a bunch of money to rescue them. They did engineer it. And so they got the they got the other banks to come in and rescue yeah. them. So okay, so they held the market strong. Everything's good. It comes right back. We have the two thousand bubble that the the tech bubble burst. Then you flash forward and you have two thousand and seven, two thousand eight. You've got the great financial crisis, and now now we 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 know that well, the Fed's going to save us, right? I mean, not me. I wasn't involved in that world, but the big banks. Wall Street was like, well, the Fed's going to save us. And they did. They bailed them out. They bailed out the banks. Those guys went home with huge bonuses, the ones who didn't go bankrupt, right? And so that's where it all started, though, back then. And then you just flash forward and you go all the way to 2020. And here we are again, even though we, you know, we've we got this virus that that's, people are starting to hear about. And, and, they're, and I mean, I heard about it in, in December, January. I was talking about it months before it all collapsed because we were we were hearing stuff about it on the street but people just kind of ignored it they ignored the risk of course who could have seen i don't want to get into covid because what a nightmare that was but who could have seen all that fair enough but man who could have seen the fed printing trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars to come save the markets on a v recovery like that wow what a moment so here we are. Here we are with all that leverage kicked up to the to the sovereign level. And we're all standing around wondering what breaks and when and how bad is it? Because you know it's 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 far higher than a non-zero probability that something, some sort of credit events ha happens. Again, we we we're, you know. We're goldfish. We're dumb creatures. We have very short memories. And so we don't. And the ones who do have memories, are, they're emboldened by the fact that, well, the system will save us. It's okay. We're on the right side of it. We're on the fiat side. It's okay. Yeah, it's interesting going back to 87 because you kind of pick up the thread there. And I agree that 
you know, long-term capital management and what happened in 98 was like a schism and a whole newfangled way. And then, uh, but, and, and I think that preceded, like you're saying, TARP and what happened in 2008. And I think that kind of was obvious, but to go on uh, and what's happened in 2020 just wasn't obvious again. It, we went back to being the goldfish and, and so they, they printed a lot of money or did a lot of QE over the last three years. And you were talking about, you know, when things break and a term you've kind of introduced, or at least to me is zombie sovereigns. I've thought a lot about zombie companies. I, I work at a bunch of them in the fortune uh, 1000 and consult for them. But uh, zombie sovereigns is kind of like thinking about things at a new level. So I want to get into what's been happening in the treasury markets. Yeah. Uh, what happened last yeah. week. And maybe to set that up, we could talk a little bit about like a debt spiral and what, what that is. Sure. I mean, uh, if you if for those who have not read my stuff about the debt spiral, it's pretty simple. I'll I'll, I'll lay it out really quickly. I have a, a thread that's pinned to my profile on Twitter that that lays it out very simply. I wrote it over a year ago that uh, talks about how we're getting into a, a debt problem. And we look, this is not new. People have been talking about the debt problem in the United States for years and years and years, for decades. Uh, ever since we got off the, the gold standard, the, the problem has been uh, progressively getting worse. And now we got into this year where it feels like it's exponentially getting worse. Whether or not that is true has to do with just how bad uh, that separation between productivity and uh, income gets. So, but... For those who don't who don't know what it is, the, the the premise is basically this: we operate. The United States operates at at a perpetual deficit. So, if you look at how much money we we take in every year in revenue, right now, let's just call it round big round numbers. Right now, we're expected to take in somewhere around four point four trillion dollars of revenues in twenty twenty three. But if you look at our spending, we're we're spending more than that. And the issue is that we're spending more than that on on programs and on promises that are are part of legislation or really can't be broken. So we're talking about the 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 mandatory expenses like entitlements. Entitlements are like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. If you look at those, those all add up to over four billion or four trillion dollars. So you've got four point four trillion dollars of revenues. You got four point two trillion dollars of entitlements just there. Then you've got your military, which is about $800 billion. They're stuffing uh, expenses, I'm sure, in other places now with the wars that we're uh, waded into. But now you're at $5 trillion of expenses. And those are these are long-term, the, the, the entitlements are, those are signed into legislation. Those are things that you have to do, you have to pay. Military, well, they're long-term contracts with with uh, defense contractors, and they're not likely to be broken and uh, and military in this nation is a very important part of of protecting the the petrodollar right so that's number two and the second the third thing we have which is is, is the interest expense on the debt itself that's another mandatory expense you you can't just not pay the interest on on your debt and so that comes out to be when you net out people will see that it's a trillion dollars of, of interest expense today and i've even I've even shown that, but there's also interest that's coming back to the treasury. So when you net it out, it's seven hundred billion dollars, and then you've got other expenses of about four hundred billion. So that comes out to be a deficit of of this year of one point seven trillion is what they're what they're claiming, but it's really two trillion dollars because of the student loan or uh, hmm. the part of the student loan forgiveness that they put back on the books, it, it, it kind of, it comes back in and lowers what the real deficit is. The real deficit is about 2 trillion. Okay, so that's the issue is that that deficit is growing. It's grown quite a bit since last year. We know this because if you just look at the debt that we have, it was 31 and a half trillion dollars last year. It's over 33 and a half trillion this year. So it's $2 trillion more. And so that deficit is growing as the Fed is raising interest rates or has raised interest rates, causing the cost of reissuing more debt. So remember, if you we we operate in a deficit, okay. So what are the three things that we can do in order to fix that or to operate around that? 
Well, since we're not ma- we're not making enough money, that's productivity. GDP is just tax revenue from us. It's our productivity, but we'll call it revenue and income, even though it's not really, you know what I'm saying, you know where I'm getting. But the bottom line is you've got three choices, right? You can either, you can either have an austerity program, cut expenses. Luke Groman posted something in, in response to me tonight. And he was like, oh yeah, they, if the government just lowered expenses uh, three to 5% immediately, then it would, so, yeah, that's not going to happen. Why is that not going to happen? Well, because as I said, most of the expenses that even that eat up all of the, the revenue already have, uh, they're signed into legislation. So you have to change legislation or you have to, you have to change something if you have different budgets around it. So, and that's political suicide. No, no politician's going to do that willingly. The second thing you can do is you can raise taxes. Well, that, uh, if you look at what happens when, uh, when, uh, sovereigns raise taxes. What happens is uh, it, it winds up it winds up disincentivizing, and uh, and re- and it it really retracts from detracts from the the productivity of companies and individuals because you can't put money back into R and D. You can't expand um, programs or lines of business or expand into new lines of businesses. So your your productivity winds up lowering. You can't have as many people on your payroll. So productivity comes down because margins, you know, that it's just that, that winds up margins come down. So everything kind of tightens in and you get to the same spot as you were before with higher taxes, lower productivity. That's no good. So the third thing you could do is just issue more debt. Well, if this debt is, it, it, it's, it's where we have to pay interest on it and when that debt matures, we have to give the principal back on it. Well, how are we going to do that? We don't make we don't make enough money to do that. So how are we going to do it? Well, we can just borrow more money. We'll just issue more debt. So we issue debt, we pay off the old debt, but when we do that, we pay it off at a higher interest rate now because the Fed has raised interest rates from what we were running zero interest rate policy ZERP, right? So when we were doing that, now they've raised interest rates to the point where. Now we're issuing new debt at higher interest rates, and it's just making the problem worse. But to answer your question about being a zombie sovereign, if you look at a if you look at a company on the on the stock exchange, and you look at what their interest expense is, and then you look at what their revenues are, if they don't if the revenues don't cover the the interest expense, then you're a zombie company you're you're like a dead man walking right and so that that income that we're looking at that the actually income not the revenue apology um but the income we're looking at our tax base doesn't cover the 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 cost the expenses and we're in in the mandatory expenses this is if we cut out all the fat even just the mandatory expenses it doesn't cover it so we're we're like a zombie sovereign we're dead man walking, but the difference is we've got a money printer. So in times of stress, in times of market stress, in times like in 20, 2008 and 2020, we can just print money, shore up markets with liquidity, devalue the dollar, which is the long-term plan. And nobody talks about it in the government or uh, in, you know, in, in the central bank, but and in the treasury, but the long-term plan is to have have perpetual high rates of inflation because as you have higher inflation, your productivity inflates on in nominal terms, you know, so the dollars are, are cheaper, you're making more of them, but you're paying down this debt that you issued back when the dollar was stronger. So now you're, it's kind of a game that you're playing where Okay, Cedric. If I if I uh, if I said, "Hey, um, I want to I want to borrow a hundred bucks from you, right?" and uh, and you're going to loan me a hundred bucks, and then I'm going to pay you a hundred bucks in ten years, plus you know five percent interest on that over the course of the, of the ten years, and you you get that five percent interest throughout that time, but then you get the hundred bucks back, 
in 10 years, how much do you think that hundred bucks is worth? It's worth nowhere near what it was when I borrowed it 10 years ago, right? So that's the game we're playing. However, what we're seeing now is that the markets have kind of woken up to this in the United States. It doesn't mean that we don't have buyers of our debt. Of course we do. We, we, are, we are fortunate to have the, the, the global reserve asset because we have the global reserve currency. And so people buy treasuries in order to have dollars to settle debts and trade that they need, energy trade in particular, they need dollars for. So they buy our debt, make an interest rate on it, hold it in their reserves so that when they need dollars, they can use those. And so that's the game we've been playing. But the jig is kind of up a little bit where there are a lot of countries who are like, Man, I don't want your garbage debt that you can, one, just seize or turn off like we did with Russia in this past year, or that you're going to just devalue significantly over the course of the next 10 years because of all of those deficits you're running, you're going to have to have a tsunami of debt to cover those deficits, which means that you're going to have to print money and start monetizing that debt because at some point in the future, we will we will crowd out that marginal balance sheet that just can't take on any more debt. And that's the worry. And so that's why you're seeing times like a few weeks ago, you saw the long end of the curve. You saw the interest rates going up and people are like, wait a minute, what? I thought we we're going to go into a recession here. Rates are going to come down. Why are the rates going up? Well, because if you're going to buy a, a, a 10, 20, 30 year bond, you're, you're going to want what's called risk premium on that. And that risk premium covers in, in, inflation that is unexpected long term. And so you need a little bit more inflation protection than just four and a half percent. And so you start seeing bonds, those yields creep up, the prices of the bonds come lower because people, and these are the, this is what, what we call the bond vigilantes. The bond vigilantes are the ones that they were coined vigilantes back in the, in the, uh, in the eighties and the early nineties when, when the investors they were not satisfied with how fast the Fed was raising rates. And so they raised rates for them. And they said, we need more. And that's basically what was happening a few weeks ago. And that kind of set the stage for what we've seen the last few weeks. Yeah, it seems like there's a push and pull. And uh, we'll get into that tweet that Luke Groman commented on in a little bit. But um, it seems like the market or the Treasury is trying to manage expectations here. So what did we see, you know, in the past couple of weeks with them trying to issue new debt? Uh, it, you know, obviously, uh, you know, and I'm curious about the bond vigilantes. Are the bond vigilantes like Bitcoiners where anyone can become a bond vigilante and say, I'm a bond vigilante today? Or is it a, a group that has been around and they've been a consistent well, sort of like Tom has yeah, been a bond like vigilante a, and Tom's still not a like bond a posse. vigilante? They're not like riding around on horses together, but it's more like you know, uh, large institutions, hedge funds who are just saying enough's enough. I need, I need more returns. I, I don't have spot on my balance sheet for this. I don't have spot in my, I, I'm not going to allocate to this at this level. I need more return for this. Um, and so that's what, that's what it is. And so they're called vigilantes, but you know, um, they're, they're, they're probably a, most of them are riding solo. Um, so, so what happened was, well, as interest rates are going higher, a couple of weeks ago, you have a Fed meeting, right? And so every time the Fed speaks, everybody listens, especially if there's a rate decision. Well, there's a rate decision coming. And so everybody is like, oh, rate decision, rate decision. Well, that week, a couple of weeks ago, the Fed's thunder was completely stolen. And so nobody was talking about the Fed. They said, oh, they're not going to raise rates. It's obvious. They're not going to raise rates until uh, unless they see something bad happen between now and, and December. They're not going to raise rates at this meeting. So they kind of ignored them. And they keyed in on the treasury announcement. So what was the treasury announcing? The same day that the Fed was announcing their, their rate decision, the treasury was announcing their fourth quarter funding. And so they have to, it's called their, their refunding and what their plan is to fund the government, the deficit for this next quarter. And so they announced that they were planning to borrow $776 billion 
which ended up being a few billion dollars less than the market expected, number one. Number two, they announced that they're going to borrow on the short end of the curve and not be trying to issue uh, you know, many 10, 20, 30-year treasuries. They're going to be issuing uh, more on the, on the T-bill side. Very short issues. We'll get into that why in a minute. But the market was ecstatic. They love this. They said, oh, this is brilliant. The uh, the treasury understands they shouldn't be issuing uh, long day treasuries. They're going to manage their expenses. And the treasury is not going to manage expenses. It's not the treasury's job to manage expenses. The treasury's job is to manage the amount of money that Congress and D.C. is spending. Whatever they're spending, the treasury is, is the enabler. They're, they're out there borrowing and managing that balance sheet in order to make sure that they can keep that whole D.C. system going. So, uh, but anyway, so the market kind of rallied and they were, they were all, they were, they were pretty, they were pretty excited about it. And, uh, but there were a few things in there that kind of caught me and, and made me step back and think, well, that that's interesting. They put this in the, re in the release, right? So the first thing was the treasury said they, they announced in the release that, that the primary dealers were, were getting, they were, they had a high degree of uncertainty around the deficit and, and growth forecast. And so that was like, oh, okay. So it's interesting that the 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 dealers, the primary dealers, these are the dealers that they're they're effectively the auction houses for these auctions where the the treasury wants to auction the stuff off and they're out there peddling it and, and they're they've agreed to buy a certain amount of it uh when the auction goes through and whatever's left over, they'll take it and then they'll resell it uh later uh, to their to their customers, their investors later. So that was the first thing. The second thing was uh, they said that the the this is normal. The Treasury anticipates that an additional quarter of increases uh, will will be likely. Yeah, of course. I mean, we're running two trillion dollar deficits. It's likely that you're going to need to to borrow more. Why? Because it's not just the deficit you're 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 funding. You're funding the the maturity of other issues. You know, as these as these bonds mature, you've got to fund that. You've got to get principal to fund that. Now, a lot of that will come back in for that for the very bond that you're issuing to to cover that maturity, but that's kind of the way it works. So, and then the third thing was that they 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 said that the treasury said that they continue to make progress on on uh, implementing a uh, what they call a regular buyback program for 2024. Okay, so this is this is something that I've talked to other uh, uh, investors and economists about, and there's there's two ways of thinking about this that I've seen, and one way is thinking that oh, this is typical that the Treasury will buy uh, like for like uh, bonds in the market from these dealers in order to make sure that they have liquidity because these are bonds that don't trade much. So. If the dealer needs to get some cash, they can they can do it that way. Um, that's one way of thinking about that. That's typical. Well, another way of thinking about it is that yeah, but we've never seen this program be in, introduced while the bonds have sold off so dramatically, and there's such a big separation between par value and market value in some of these bonds. I mean, if you have a thirty year treasury. That this could have that this has basis basis risk that goes all the way out, uh, however many years are left until that bond matures. So, um, but they're talking about in essence, you may you may already know this, Cedric, but when when uh, they're they're called off the run treasuries. So off the run treasuries are back in the day, back when I started. You'd walk into a bond desk and the bond traders had these big stacks of paper and they were the huge reams of paper, that dot matrix, you know, and they would just flip through and look at all the bonds and look at pricing there on the bonds and see where they should be priced. Well, if the if a bond wasn't on that sheet, because we didn't have computers like we did, we weren't surrounded by computers. The bond traders had stacks, like it was an, it was pretty inefficient compared to today, where they were just on the phone piece of paper, making bids and offers according to that, according to that morning's run. Um, so, but if it wasn't on that run, yeah, if it wasn't on that, in the, in that, in those sheets, they was called off the run. So it meant that it was pretty illiquid. It didn't trade very much. So you were like, mm, I'll, you know, you could make up the price, whatever you, whatever you felt comfortable with. Typically that meant a higher 
margin for for security so you're like okay if i'm gonna buy this from you i don't know where i could trade in the street because it's it's not even on the run here it's something that people don't trade you know it's like in like uh a, like natalie brunell i was talking to her the next day after all this was happening she made the pretty good analogy of it's like a baseball card that just isn't traded in on um, in the uh circuits and that's it's it's fair yeah you don't know where it should be priced so that's what they're talking about doing and to me that sounds like it's it, it sounds very much like uh stealth QE or yield curve control, where they can just decide where they're going to inject liquidity in spots for dealers who need it in uh, at prices that make sense to make sure they inject enough liquidity into, them, into the markets to keep them going. That's the way I see it. And so it remains to be seen exactly what that program is detailed to be out, but I'm aware of it. And we'll be watching it and seeing exactly what, what comes of it. Um, but that's that's what it seems to be to me on the face of it. So that kind of sets up everything for, well, the market's happy. It sounds like the treasury's got their got their uh, their house in order. They're gonna keep borrowing on the short end. Why are they doing that? Because they can issue T-bills and there's a lot of money sitting in something called the reverse repo facility. This is all the excess cash that's, that's sitting on uh, major banks balance sheets in, in their treasuries that they they need to do something with. So they're and uh, but they can't buy any more treasuries with them because it 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 trips their uh, leverage ratios. Right. So they they have to make sure that they keep very liquid. And one of the things they can do is they can take that capital and park it overnight at the Fed at something called the reverse repo facility. And it's effectively getting the overnight rate close to it uh, within a few basis points and uh, and getting return for that capital, just sitting there. Now they can take that money and buy T-bills because those T-bills will be, they'll, they'll mature in just a few weeks or a month or two, and they can get that money back. So that's kind of, it's allowed within those ratios. And so that's what they've been doing is the treasury has been issuing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars worth of of t bills and that and just a little bit better rate than you're getting at the reverse repo and they're kind of they're kind of teasing that money out of that reverse repo facility you can see it's been happening for months because the reverse repo during 2020 2020 and 2021 when these banks were flooded with capital from the qe well it got up to be 2.4 trillion dollars 2.5 trillion dollars sitting in there I, I don't remember what the exact top tick was, 2.6 trillion, but around 2.4 trillion dollars has been sitting there for the last, for going into this year. And then we hit the we hit the debt ceiling crisis and the treasury they well, you know, Congress solved the debt ceiling crisis by kicking the can down the road and saying, "Well, we don't have a ceiling yet. We'll talk about that later." And so the treasury said, "Okay, so we can go ahead and keep borrowing and they flooded the market with T-bills and that took over a trillion dollars out. So it's taken about $1.5 trillion out of that facility. And we're down to under a trillion dollars in that facility now. And so that's where we're at. And so it's, it, I don't know how much needs to be in there for these banks to operate properly and efficiently and have enough liquidity overnight in order to be borrowing and, uh, and uh, lending to each other to make sure that they have enough liquidity for market movements, but I, I'm 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 guessing it's it's more than five hundred billion dollars. So we're at nine hundred billion, nine hundred and eighty billion. There's not that much left in there, but we'll just put that over there. But this is this is what they've been doing is they've been borrowing on the short end, and they said that they're going to be comfortable doing that. They're going to be comfortable with issuing more T bills than normal a higher ratio of T-bills than normal, which the ratio is supposed to be about 15, 20%. Well, they're way above that. And they said they're they're happy to do that for a while. Well, Street loves that because they see the reverse repo. They said, oh, they can keep taking money out of there. It's fine. They're also drawing money out of uh, out of deposits. So if you have a deposit in the bank, rather than just leaving it in the, as a deposit in the bank, you can put it in a money market account. And so that will... Uh, buy T-bills. And so that, that money's moved over as well. So you've seen deposits draw down, the, the reverse repo draw down, and that's paying for these T-bills. 
Right. So, and people who are sitting on cash, like me in my IRA, I'm in T-bills. Why? Because it's a it's a great way to to get a a, a good return and without um, without almost any uh, basis risk, interest rate risk. Interest rates can go up and down. I'm going to get paid my you know my interest rate uh, for that my annualized interest rate from month to month. I've only got one month risk. It's not that big of a deal. <clears throat> so so they've been doing that. The question is how long they can do it for. And that brings us to what happened last week, which is when they had that 30-year bond auction that was announced in their fourth quarter funding, the $24 billion bond auction. I'm sitting there on a call with uh, with partners for uh, an investment in my hedge fund. And uh, and I'm and these messages are popping up and I'm getting questions uh, from people uh, who are like, you know, what, what is going on with this bond auction? Did you see this? Did you see what's going on here? And, uh, I was like the bond auction. Went, oh God, the 30 year bond auction is today. And I took a peek and I, and I instantly was, I just, I, I couldn't even believe it. I was like, what, what that can't be right. That's like, that is, a, that, that is absolutely terrible. It's a terrible auction. And so for your listeners, to break it down quickly and easily, uh, basically there are a few things, and I've got a, a I've got a thread. My newsletter um, it walks through all of this super simply, um, but you can you can find those on my on my uh, profile. I've, I've written threads about them, but basically, when you look at a treasury auction, the way it works, Cedric, and you know this, but again for your listeners, is it's like they're um, it's a Dutch auction. And what that means is, so if you're an investor and you want to participate in that auction, you want to buy some bonds, then you put in the amount that you're willing to buy at what interest rate. And so the the Treasury then has this this run and, and on their you know on their sheets and their model, they can see how many bonds are bid for each level of 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 uh, interest rate for each level of yield. And so, and they'll look at that and they'll make a dis- they'll, they'll say well if we need 24 billion dollars well all anybody who was willing to get a yield from all the way below up to the yield that we need to give them in order to soak up those 24 billion dollars well they'll all get that top yield so that it's so that's the dutch auction you're you're making a bet that so if you say well I'm willing to buy $10 million with a 4.7% yield. And the yield comes in at, well, they needed to, they needed a 4.75% yield to get enough capital. Then you'll get 4.75 and you'll get filled for your 10 million. Somebody who wanted 4.8, they wouldn't get filled. So that's the way it kind of works, right? So that's the auction and the system. And then when you look at, who goes in there, you've got your your direct bidders, which are, they're both your individuals who are just going to get, if you're an individual, you're like you or me, you get into treasury direct, you can try to, you can enter the auction uh, and you can say, I want to buy a thousand dollars worth of bonds and they'll give you a thousand dollars worth of bonds um, at whatever price it ends up being. You would get that 4.75%. You don't have a choice. You can't say, oh, I want to buy $10,000 worth of bonds. If it's 4.8, you don't get that choice. Only the institutions get that. But so you've got the institutions and individuals. Those are the direct bidders. Then you've got your indirect bidders, which are the uh, which are international buyers. And then you've got your primary dealers who are the auction houses, basically. And so when we look at the with when you look at this auction that happened last week, the the bid to cover, which is the total amount of bids to cover the auction came in at about 2.2, 2.24, okay, X, which is 2.24 times amount of, of bonds or bid for than what the treasury needed. And that number, it's a pretty bad number. It, in, in an auction like this, it should be more like 2.4, 2.5, somewhere around there. And it came in at 2.2. That's pretty bad. So that's the first thing. 
The second thing is that the the foreign buyers just ev- they just evaporated. So, like in the beginning of this year, we had an auction for eighteen billion dollars of of thirty years, and the the foreign buyers there was there were seventy five percent of it. Last month there was sixty five percent of it. This month there was sixty percent of it. So what does that mean? That means that the deal. So when you add up the direct bidders and the indirect bidders, that only came out to be about seventy five percent of the auction, which left set with which left twenty five percent of the auction that was dumped onto the direct the uh, the primary dealers. So remember when the, we we talked about just a little bit ago about how when the treasury made their announcement, they said that, oh, the primary dealers are a little bit nervous. Well, now we know why. Because the primary dealers are like, these bond vigilantes, like, I don't know if they're going to bid to the price the, 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 uh, price that the, the treasury needs them to. And so we may get saddled with a lot of the stuff. They got saddled with a lot of it, 25%. That, that's typically down around, you know, back in January, that was 9%. It got up to be almost 20 percent like 18 percent last month and now it's 25 percent it's like whoa hold on where are the foreign buyers where is everybody and so you know, the, the southwest airlines uh commercial like, where is everybody and so there they are the primary dealers are saddled with all this debt so but that wasn't even really the biggest thing because that's pretty it's pretty dismal you're seeing the auctions get bigger and you're seeing the the demand get smaller. Bad. That's a that's a bad combo, right? So, the the craziest thing is that this auction had something that was called some auctions tail, and the tail is the difference between where the bonds are trading pre market. So there's a win issued market that that trades before the actual auction, and so banks can trade with each other. And so that that level is where the banks and investors expect the auction to be. And if the auction, it ends up being that the interest rate that the treasury has to give on this bond is higher than it was pre-market in the when issued, if it means that it's worse, then it's a tail. It has a tail. Typically, this tail could be one, two, you know, basis points, three basis points is pretty ugly, right? You get to four, five, six basis points range, and it is, that is phenomenally bad. It is, it's abysmal. This auction came in at 5.3 basis points tail, which is just absolutely mind-blowing how bad that, I. It, it, this is the worst tailing auction to give context around it cedric this is the worst tailing auction we have seen in this in this issue since 2011 that's when the s&p downgraded us debt for the first time us debt got downgraded and that's when that auction this auction didn't even have this had no event there was no news there was no like it wasn't like we had some sort of uh you know uh credit event where there was market meltdown possibilities and there were there was contagion and there was nothing it was just a really 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 ugly auction really ugly so the market reaction was kind of fitting because number one the the first thing so some people started talking about well there was there was a wasn't there a malware attack like a so something happened out in uh, in China, and okay, the answer is yes. There's a there's a bank out there, one of the largest banks in the world, called Commercial Bank of uh, the uh, Industrial and Commercial Bank of, of China (ICBC). Apparently, they had it's not funny, but they had a malware attack where it forced ICBC to take their operations offline, and they were settling trades and transfers capital transfers with USB sticks. They're actually physically running around with them back and forth from desk to desk and around the cities with them because of this malware attack. They couldn't switch their uh, their systems on. So people are starting to claim that right after this auction, people were claiming that, well, that disrupted the auction. That's why the participation, the international participation was so bad. But uh, when you look at it, 
apparently, and this is uh, this is from an article that I read in Bloomberg, is uh, the 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 unit in ICBC that deals with the U.S. Treasuries in in, in is only twenty four or twenty three billion dollars of total assets. So it's way too small to have had a material impact on this on this auction. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, even if they were they were ten, if they were trying to bid for ten, I mean, how much were they trying to bid for? Ten percent? No, no way. So, not likely. So, and then to cinch that up, Yellen was asked about it herself right after the auction and or that night Friday, and she said, "No, we haven't seen any impact on the treasury market or or the auction from that hack." So, that kind of you know, that, that kind of covers that. I don't believe it. So what was the action, the, the the market reaction to it? Well, not surprisingly, other investors saw this and said, holy shit, what just happened? And the U.S. Treasury yield moved over 4% in, it's like 4.3% in a matter of hours. And most of that came in just a few minutes. This is a, this is a U.S. Treasury. Okay, this is the, the, the global reserve asset. In the most pristine security in the on the on the planet, and it, it is trading like a tech stock, and you're watching these yields, and it hasn't calmed down. These things have been trading up and down one two percent yield daily, <laughs> and so is a this is a kind of a heavy market reaction, but fitting because of the just the nature of that that auction was so ugly. And if you look at the the price action across the entire spectrum of treasuries, it was it was it was basically the worst daily loss since May, and so it was pretty bad. Um, and so, yeah, that's where you know when you get for me when I see reaction to the CPI from yesterday and see the market's reaction, see yields come straight down, see the market scream. Well, the reaction is it's basically the market saying, well, the Fed's going to, they're not going to raise rates again. They're going to pivot. We may be coming into a soft landing here. Interest rates are going to come down. No big deal. But it seems that the market has forgotten that we're still running $2 trillion deficits. And if we do enter a recession, those deficits only get worse. Why? Well, because entitlement spending goes up as you pay more for programs like unemployment and social services. So those go up and your revenue comes down. That's the definition of a, of a recession. GDP comes down, tax receipts come down, the deficit gets wider. At the same time that our, our interest rates have gone up and we're paying more on interest expense on our debt. So it just it just exacerbates the issue. So I'm watching the markets and thinking that wow, the again here we are our goldfish, no 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 memory. And but the question really is, Cedric, is how bad of a recession are we going to come into? How quickly are these rates going to come down? And one thing I will say is I do believe that. You, you can make more money on the long end of the curve as a trade, not as a long, long-term investment, but as a trade. Why? Because if a, because if interest rates come down, uh, even if long-term rates don't come down as much as short-term rates, the multiplier effect on that duration, right, on that on that bond over all those years means that the price the price has come in so much that that price will rise more. The price of the bond will rise more than the price of a, a bond that is just one month, two months out. So I do believe that uh, for a trade. I do not believe that it's a great place to park capital for 30 years because ultimately we are in the spot where we have no choice, but as I said, to run these deficits and match them somehow with high perpetual inflation. And so you will see, in my opinion, you will see some greatly massaged and possibly just complete falsified 
uh, inflation numbers. So like yesterday, you saw that CPI number, and part of the number was health costs was down. What did it say? It was so absurd. 34, it was 20, 43% or it something. Was something like, yeah, let's call it 34%. I don't know. I didn't see my, did were your costs down that much? Oh my, my gosh, I took up. my daughter to the ER for a croup cough in the middle of the night. Oh, we gosh. got into an empty ER building. So that was great. It was empty, but they weren't utilizing anything in there. So I don't know. And we spent about 15 minutes in there. I think she got a Tylenol and uh, the cool air helped clear her lungs. And that was, uh, I think, about four forty nine hundred dollars <laughs> Oh, my God. Uh, plus the $250 <clears throat> bill from the physician, which is separate. Yes. That actually seemed somewhat reasonable. Uh, we're in discussions with the R unit now, but everything is getting I don't know distorted. Where I, like, I can't stop now. <laughs> well, they built a building and they're not utilizing it at 100% and <laughs> yeah. they're chopping up the cost and they're passing it on. And the insurance <laughs> right. companies are saying we'll take on 22% of it because in the end of the day, we're going to raise their premiums anyway and recoup and stick the, but, you know, me with 78% on top of my ginormous premiums that my employer and my I'm co-paying and uh, it's, right. So answer me this. If the line item was health insurance, I just peeked at it. It was yeah. health insurance at, and it was down 34%. You've got to be kidding me. I mean, that's not even, I mean, like my health insurance so, is not down 34%. Let, let, let's get what this is getting at though. So, I mean, we we're to me, this is like banana Republic style information where either information is published and it's revised or it's obviously uh, schemed or manipulated or computated in a new way. It's obfuscated. It's buried in here. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, we talked about, you know, Black, I think it was Black Monday in 87, LTCM, uh, you know, and, and even TARP. There seemed like these were crystallized moments in time where something happened and, and bells went off and the, the the warning lights on the on the on the dashboard that the main people were at were all blinking. And now I'm getting like kind of weirded out because it's really fucking weird. Like, I feel like these lights are going off a lot in a lot of different places. Yeah. And it's hard to discern what is a real warning because and I try to go drive through not my just neighborhood, but a lot of different kinds of neighborhoods just driving through town. And I'm trying to discern, like, what is changing in the real world? And I still see, you know, gas stations humming, restaurants humming, um, hospitals humming, whatever it is. People don't, it doesn't seem to be affecting people. I don't know, but but I still see all these household debt numbers going up, mortgage going up, credit card, 401k is getting dwindled. People are working multiple jobs. I don't know if everyone's just hiding the stress and and and, and obfuscating the, the impact of all this, but are any of these lights meaningful or are we like on this upward trajectory like Weimar Republic and it's just going to be blinking and glaring and and lots of warning yeah, sirens great, the whole, the yeah. whole way. Yeah, that's and, a good and, question. Yeah. And you're kind of like, okay, this is the new normal. All these warning lights are kind of like meaningless. And we have to develop a whole new warning system in this age of, you know, it's, I don't know, money printing or whatever you want to call it. Uh, Cause it's kind of like when you look at, you know, the conversation around housing and, you know, people say, well, we've had 8% mortgages before, but we, we've never had, you know, housing to income multiples like this before on, you know, principle this high. So 8% yeah. on a $100,000 mortgage when you're making $33,000 a year is $500 uh, extra month if you get a 5% interest rate hike. But when you're talking about a million dollar house or a $600,000 house, all of a sudden, you know, the 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 proportions the same, but now you got a $35,000 mortgage hike and uh the person's still making 33,000 or 48,000 or something that just doesn't ratio out. Not computing. Yeah. But the answer is honestly I think uh we have a we have a little bit of the Instagram effect going on around here where people uh they're they're really really reluctant to give up their their uh little Lifestyles. um comforts and uh and pleasures and I don't blame them. I mean you're working your tail off every day, day in, day out, day in, day. You probably have two jobs. You just want to grab a Starbucks on the way to that or you know, a Dutch a Dutch bros just to just because it's I just want to grab well something. now the you know a job doesn't pay for the rent or the mortgage or the food. So what do you, you go out and the food in, sucks? Yeah. You go out the food sucks, you're 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 uh and we won't let this devolve into a, a rant, but right. 
your 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 grocery bill is multiples of what it was and so you're what are you doing you're charging and if you're if you're that that single parent or you're or you're you're you know just a two income family that needs a third income or a fourth income and now you're you're working a, a night job and you you know you're you're you and your spouse are both working night jobs and what a mess and so you're and you're charging stuff that you actually need so you're starting to see people charge food and that's where the so problem this is where in. my greatest my my the fear i think is that the interest rates on credit cards are going to get so high that people aren't going to be able to afford they the are. interest on their credit they're cards that they're they're dumping they're their necessities there. on these credit cards hoping yeah. rates are going to come back down or something's going to break and and go their yeah. way and yeah. and i think then they're going to drain their 401k's to to make up the difference and, they might, and, and or they'll just default on the credit cards, declare ooh. bankruptcy. It's a, it's a, it's a problem. And so you see it happening already in subprime. Okay, so remember when, when, so when the government pushed out these stimulus checks, one of the effects of that, Cedric, was that there was a whole, there was, there's a whole slice of of demographic that graduated from subprime into just you know, low credit because they suddenly had all this money in their account. So their debt to their uh, debt to income ratio had, you know, had, uh, had moved higher, lower. So a, be a better number. And so they graduated out. Well, the New York, I think it was the New York fed. It was either the New York fed or the San Francisco fed had put out a report recently that said they expect the savings from all of the uh, from the saving the savings and the stimulus checks to be completely wiped out by this quarter. That's gone. So a lot of those people have then been downgraded back into the subprime category. So you've got that going on at the same time that you've got the subprime category, the the amount of bankruptcies or the amount of uh, missed payments on car loans and credit card debt is rising. It's not anywhere near where it was in 2008, but it's on that trajectory. But they're the first ones, right? So you see, it's it's simple. When you when you have when you have interest payments that you're not covering with your income, then you are, you know, you you're a you're the you're effectively you're the first one to go bankrupt as an individual, right? So you're you're going to default. Well, the same thing happens with small companies that their the cost of capital is rising, and so as the cost of capital goes up, their margins decrease. So they have to do things to take care of that. Well, they're either going to default on interest payments, default on on debt, or they'll have to fire people. In order to, you know, tighten the reins and take in and, and make sure they have enough capital that they can make their interest payments, they don't default. And so those small companies start defaulting. You're starting to see that happen. You've got this big commercial real estate problem that's happening out there. It's just, it's just looming out there. It, everybody knows it's out there, but nobody knows just how bad it is. It's it could be very bad. We don't know. That's another problem. You know, you're starting to see unemployment tick up. You're starting to see, you know, you do see the, the, we still have inflation, but like you're seeing numbers and like shipping numbers tanking, like no pun intended. So, but there's, there, there are red flags around. The one red flag that everybody points to that we've been talking about is that, well, employment's still good. That means that we're not in a recession. We're not going into recession, but I'm telling you every single time, go back and look. I have charts on it. Look at when a recession occurs and when unemployment spikes. And every single time, it's after we get into recession that unemployment spikes and it, it, is, it is a vertical wall. It looks like El Cap every single time. And so, yeah, you might have, you know, three, four, five percent unemployment, three, four percent unemployment. And then all of a sudden it, it goes from like three, four, five percent to <clears throat> straight vertical. And a whole lot of people lose their jobs. That's my concern. That is my sincere concern that we're running into. 
the, the question is, how quickly does the Fed step in? How quickly do they team up with the Treasury? You have like endless pints of beer. And I feel like I should have. I don't have one. It's they're tasty. I'm, I'm on my second, <laughs> my second pint. I need to. Have, I need to have my <laughs> mind set up. So I don't usually do uh, evening podcasts. So, uh, but you know, um, my you know, so my my concern though is that uh, is that people are going to be caught off guard here, you know, and uh, and this, uh, you know, um, that that we're going to get into a situation where the the fed does have to step in rapidly they team up the treasury and they because we have some sort of credit event that is that's the that's probably the worst thing is that a credit event happens you have a you have a v drawdown and recovery just like in 2020 but what do you do how can you protect yourself it's really hard to time those you know if you remember march of 2020 timing that was tough i mean i was out there nibbling at stocks but man it was it was it was not that easy to just time it perfectly you couldn't time the bottom of bitcoin time the bottom of you know the tech stocks that was pretty that was pretty i mean oil went to zero went below zero that was crazy you know so things just they get really 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 uh strange and dis disjointed but one thing that does happen is everything correlates to one and sells off that's just reality. So that's what I'm watching for. And uh, that's why, you know, uh, I have, I own things like gold and Bitcoin, because I do believe that again, the only solution is to go, is to have another 1997, 2007 style bailout where the Fed and the Treasury team up, they pour liquidity into the markets to short up and you get another injection of inflation and uh, and we go back to square one and we're back to do we go into weimar republic the answer is no to answer that question i don't believe that that's where we're headed yet the us dollar is the global reserve currency so we have the we have the luxury of swallowing other weaker currencies in the meantime so as other currencies kind of die out or they go into hyperinflation, whether it's in Venezuela or Argentina or in Lebanon, wherever it is. And we just, it just gets swallowed into the dollar, meaning they have to go into a dollar standard and issue debt in a dollar, a uh, US dollar, uh, because they can't issue debt in their own currency. Well, we effectively swallow them. And so that's, that's, the, that's the issue. And that, I think that's going to keep happening. Um, and so, that can happen for a while. It can happen for for years and years and years and years that we we're we're in this cycle where the U.S. just it just swallows other currencies while um, we continue. It's not it's not as though our currency is any better. Uh, it's the as as Greg Foss likes to say it's the it's the cleanest shirt in, in the pile of dirty laundry. But in in reality, it's still inflating. It's still debasing. So how do you protect yourself from that? That's the point. That's why I'm out here. That's why I'm talking about this stuff. That's why I'm so adamant about, you know, if you do not understand Bitcoin, please, for the love of God, read the two books that are, they're standing right behind you between Lynn Alden's book and, uh, and Safe Dean's book. That one's the fiat standard. Also read the Bitcoin standard. If you haven't read those books, please, please read them. Form your own opinion. But that's, that's where we're at. You, we need people to understand why the money is broken and what the standard should be. And, you know, there's a way to protect yourself. And that's why I'm out here talking about this stuff. That's why I talk about debt all the time. Yeah, well, we're definitely in stormy seas. And, and that's why I see Bitcoin as an arc and uh, something to kind of be on while you're trying to get through this, this passage of time. Uh, and I see that as uh, the least risky place to be. And you can kind of have your bets around, maybe around that. But uh, before we get into the really fun stuff, um, I'm kind of curious because you tweeted out about what, uh, what, what's what been on the Bloomberg Terminal. I think it was today with sort of soft landing in 2024. And I'll buttress this up against plate licking plebs question that he put out on Twitter. Do you think the Fed will deal with 2024 as maturing debt by raising interest rates 
to attract foreign capital or if they will lower rates, you know, by, you know, print it themselves. And so really what I'm getting at here, though, is do you, do you see a soft landing in 2024? Do you see the, ped, the Fed pivoting or lowering rates at all? Yeah, no, I don't see a soft landing uh, my, myself because I just see there's just too much leverage in the system. I see that there, there's a, there's a, uh, you know, a, a significant meaning a, a more than non-zero probability of some sort of credit event that that causes uh, the the Fed and the Treasury have to come in and 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 inject liquidity into the market. So the answer is uh, no. I don't. I don't think that they're going to raise rates in order to attract capital. Um, the treasury market may end up having that done for them. And uh, and meaning that if we do need to issue mountains of debt, well, the bond vigilantes will ensure that they're getting paid for that that risk. And so that, that could happen. So um, yeah, that's a, it, Nobody knows when the recession will really hit. It's a very difficult thing to time. But remember, the Fed and we are all looking at stale data. So when you hear data that you think, well, that's not really, that that doesn't jive with me and what I'm seeing. Well, it's from a couple months ago. So, um, you know, that's, uh, you just, you have to remember that it's, it, this, this, then the data is, it, it is manipulated and it's, it's massaged and it, it, it doesn't add up. Remember the, really the, the fed is, uh, you know, their, their mandate is to, um, you know, keep stable prices, meaning, uh, not let inflation get out of control. Meaning like go to first principles here. Why? 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 Well, the first principle is because we need to have confidence in the U.S. dollar. That's why. And so they need to make sure that investors in our securities, in in our treasuries, are not worried about the dollar being, you know, debased too too quickly, or else they will demand a much higher rate of return for that for that risk so we'll sure. see just how much debt we have to issue yeah so i wonder like tom anderson asked like what you know tricks does the fed have up their sleeve you know when the house of cards continues to fall like you know when the backstop facility runs out with the reverse repo or when the treasury yeah. uh, auctions fail or you know are they going to do qe versus yield co- yield curve control yeah it's a good question so i want to make it clear that i don't think i don't see the i don't see the fed uh, entering the market like Bank of Japan and and uh, executing outright yield curve control where they say, we're going to keep rates at, at this level. I don't see them doing that. I do see them doing things that are creative like that buyback program or coming up with other acronyms to plug holes, whatever they come up with for that the commercial real estate uh, pending debacle, debacle, we'll see. I don't know. Uh, we already have the, the bank term funding program and that came out because of interest rate risk. And so they had to save commercial banks there and they'll continue doing those things. And I think that that's, that's where the injection of liquidity comes in is when they're going to do things like that where, oh no, no, it's not QE. It's not QE, but it's really QE. It's really, you know, capital that wasn't there, that shouldn't be there, that isn't in the market, that they're providing the market. That's what I see happening. And they're just going to con- continue doing this. And I do think that the the Fed is going to back off before uh, we, you know, I, let's put it this way. I think that the 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 whatever the Fed and the Treasury are seeing, I think that they'll stomach three to four percent inflation rates before they tank this economy and push us into a depression. That's my that's my take on it. So we'll we'll see how it plays out. But I think behind the scenes, whatever they're looking at, they may be like, well, it's actually running like three or 4%. But if we say it's two or 3%, that's okay. Two, two and a half percent, that's okay. It's running three, four, five, six percent. That's good for them. That's good. High perpetual inflation is good. Frog's boiling in the pot. So I got to ask about a Bitcoin ETF. Is that important? Do you think that's going to happen? 
So the answer is, I do think it's going to happen. I think we're going to have a number of them. Is it important? It depends on what what you're, what angle you're looking at it from. If you're looking at it from an angle that you want the you want Bitcoin to become a stable asset that does not have as much volatility as it does today for the long term and have widespread spread rapid adoption, then I do think that it is important and it can help. Is it necessary? No, it's not necessary for Bitcoin to survive. Absolutely not. However, it could, and I believe it will, an, an, an ETF, which will have a number of them, I, th I think that they will uh, be super highway on-ramps for institutional capital because it's just not easy for institutions to hold Bitcoin like an individual. They don't have the structure, the operational facilities to do it. It's not like they can just buy it, manage their keys, you know, settle it, price it. It's it's just not like that. It's diff it's difficult, and they have a lot of 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 career risk to do that. And quite honestly, most of them don't understand it yet. But when we have an, an ETF, it's gonna it's gonna force them to understand it pretty quickly, because when you know you see desks and other investors take down one or two percent allocations separate allocations to bitcoin you're going to say well, i i need to i really need to dig in here i'm going to get a little bit and that's called legging into the trade as you know i'm going to get a little bit and then i'm going to do my deep research and they will get that understanding i think it's going to force that it's going to it's going to accelerate that and so but again when you get trillions of dollars in this ecosystem and we're talking you know multiples of where it uh, of where it is now then the the volatility will dampen you won't you won't have these 80 percent up 80 percent down years it's just uh, i don't see that happening i see it really damping out because when you have that much capital in there you have the ability to move in and out of it without having to move the price in in order to you know um, it, you're, it, it's not, you're not, um, it's, you're not seeking the price, you know, you, you get out of that mode. So, yeah. um, yeah. I think there's a lot of interesting things here. Um, I, I think it will definitely bring a lot of cash inflows into Bitcoin, uh, custody aside. I think, uh, you know, things like having BlackRock and Goldman and these other entities behind Bitcoin brings a lot of marketing to Bitcoin. Around volatility, I find this very interesting because I'm still of the thought that maybe volatility will increase as we go higher in price. And part of that is uh, just the notion of being priced in sats one day. So at a million dollars of Bitcoin, you're talking a penny a sat. And if you could log on to your exchange and pay one cent a sat, I don't know why you wouldn't pay two cents a sat when you frame it up that way. Uh, mm -hmm. And it could literally double on the overnight. Uh, but something else uh, I see is that, you know, maybe these large funds, ETFs, uh, where just institutional money has to rebound to redistribute out of Bitcoin every so often in terms of uh, allocation. If they want to stay at a three to five percent, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but what I but I, but in just in terms of the short term, I'm not sure when we're going to get an ETF because of what I see going on with like GBTC and sort of Genesis and D the digital currency group and sort of the questions around the industry from that perspective. Um, but it'll definitely be an interesting eva evolution uh, for Bitcoin. Uh, and, and you know, you hear the rumor, like maybe BlackRock's going to grab the GBDC bag and seed their Bitcoin that way. And there's just so much I, drama. I, I, don't, um, I don't see it, but, you know. But so but the, I want to turn our attention a little bit to sort of uh, you, you mentioned something on Natalie's show where, you know, Bitcoin is marching to its own beat or, or marching to its own trade right now. Yeah. And, and to me, that sounds a little bit. It doesn't necessarily infer that this is happening, but it, it it kind of precedes or makes me think about decoupling. Yeah, well, I, again, I don't think this is the point is that we need volatility to dampen and more capital. We need Bitcoin to have a much larger market value in order to for it to actually decouple from risk assets. Right now, it's just seen as a risk asset. It, it, it acts like one. You, I mean, that's just reality. I, 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 is it one in 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 structure? No, but it in in investments and in trading, it is because of the volatility. Well, when you do get that that massive amount of capital in there, you know, 
um, that allows institutions to actually be involved in it, then they can own it. You can't, if you're, if you're Texas teachers and you've got, you know, one of your billion dollar funds and you want to get in and out of this thing and you want to have a few percent position, that's kind of, that's, you're talking about, you know, 20, $30 million of capital just on that fund. What if, what about you? You know, it, it's, that's a lot of capital to be moving in and out without having worry of price friction of, of uh, you know, having that intraday price discovery. So is it, uh, so that's, that's the way I see it, Cedric. Um, and I do, I do believe that it does decouple. Once we get two things, we get the, the asset to be large enough to be, be able to move in and out and have some stability in price. That's number one, but that really doesn't come until what is most important, which is a broad and deep understanding of why Bitcoin is different from everything else. When we get to that level, that's when everything else kind of filters in, but they're going to, they kind of feed on each other, right? So the ETF allows institutions to dip in, then they have to do some work, then they can get bigger, then bigger institutions can dip in, then they can do their work. And that's kind of the way I see it happening. Sure. I mean, uh, it's going to be an exciting ride. So the, the final portion of the show. So uh, it was January 3rd, 2022, when you put out a tweet thread that uh, really caught my eye. And I think I, I'd probably noticed your Twitter account before this, but this was something that I really kind of dug into. So you wrote a tweet thread around, are sports a waste of time? <laughs> That's right. So That's I'd right. love to get into this a little bit as we roll out. Uh, you started playing hockey when you were four years old. Uh, you know, you, you suffered an injury and you had to make a giant career change. And I'd love to kind of get into some of the lessons or the 17 lessons that that you learned. Yeah, I, I have to, I'll have to bring it up because. But, I so while you're bringing exactly it up, I'll ask a preceding question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so who is your favorite hockey player of all time? And uh, that doesn't have to be who you think is the best of all time. And I'll, I'll, I'd like to ask that, too. Well, my favorite growing up was probably Bobby Orr. Um, and I mean, I'm, and you know, I, because I was more of a Bruins fan um, growing up, funny enough, uh, where I was. We were equally York. distanced from New York City and probably Boston. Yeah. And I played a lot of hockey out in Boston. So, uh, but I loved, I, I loved watching, uh, I loved watching him. He was kind of like just a, he was a force of stability out there. That was, that was always fun. Um, so, yeah, that that's uh, that's probably that's so, Lemieux or Gretzky then best of all time. Lemieux or Gretzky best of all time. Gretzky, come on. <laughs> Gretzky and, uh, is uh, yeah. Our guy is is Yaramir Yager in this conversation. Wow, I mean that guy. Uh, if you want to ask about who's the um, you know, the what the uh, what's the prototype? The, no, I mean he was he. God, he's just the energizer, but like he just wouldn't shut off, right? I mean, he was playing into his 40s. The guy is like the longevity of that career is just, it's mind boggling. It's incredible. But what I'll say about what, what I'll say about Yarm or Yager is that that just shows the mental and physical discipline that he had over the course of his career. Yeah, he had injuries, but to have the discipline to keep going all those years, it's absolutely incredible. Yeah, my favorite player growing up was Mike Bossy, Mike Sniper Bossie. from the wing. Yes, 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 um, yes. I love that. I, I liked guys yeah. like Brian Trottier and Dennis Potvin. Yeah, um, sure, of course, of course. You know the, the workhorses. Um, I think I find it interesting, especially with sports. Like you have someone like Wayne Gretzky, and magically, a lot of players around them also became great. Like Yari, I think it was Yari Curry. Yeah, isn't that, and, isn't that funny? Is that they, they just raise the level of everybody? Yeah, Paul Coffey and Mark Messier, yeah. and I honestly believe, and I, I think I saw it with Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen that. By being in practice with them and and seeing the secret sauce and getting shared probably things they wouldn't have shared with their rivals and their enemies, and just that insider act access, and then wanting to be able to perform around that kind of person and no and, and live up to it, I think raises everyone around them. It, it, um, it happened, yeah, it happened for me at Yale for sure. I was surrounded by players who were better than me and definitely made me a better player. And then, I mean, I watched it happen instantaneously uh, when I was in New York um, when I was trying out for the Rangers. Um, 
we were in we were in right town hilton and um we were practicing and uh we were, we're actually we're, we're in the right town hilton and we're all just kind of doing a stretch in one of the ballrooms and uh because when back then i don't know where they do it now but the tryouts we they were at uh they were at rye playland so if you've ever seen the movie big where that boardwalk is that's where rye playland is so that's where we would go into and there's a rink there that we would practice and and that's where the tryouts were um so we're in the right town hilton we're sitting there uh in uh in this circle it's kind of we're just kind of joking around we're throwing socks i'm i'm a i'm I'm a rookie rookie like i'm just and even worse i'm coming from an ivy league school and so i'm like pretty quiet but i'm watching these guys like tony amante and brian leach and they're just they're throwing socks at each other and messing around with each other and uh you know um kovalev was there and Nemchinov, you remember all the guys. So, and so I'm, we're, we're just the whole circle. We're just in a big circle, kind of doing a half ass stretch at best. And so the suddenly the door creaks open and the, and the whole room falls silent. It was like, whoa. And I, and I turn around, I look and Mark Messier is walking in. And he walks up into the center of the circle. And I mean, nobody's talking like Brian Leach shut up, you know, Tony Monty shut up. And they were like, Adam Graves didn't say anything. Like we're just uh, sitting there like, and we, and he walks up and he's like, this is it. This is the year that we win it all. And it starts here and it starts now. Man, nobody messed around for the rest of camp. I mean, it was crazy. It it was like instantly elevated everybody's expectations, their discipline instantly. It was pretty wild. So he made and they did. Graves they went on to win. The, they they went on to win the Stanley Cup. Yep. Without he called him. it, and he, he brought it home. I think he willed it. He was that kind of player, that yep. kind of leader. And he made Adam Graves, I think, a heck of a player. Uh, went Adam from a was scrappy a scrappy fighter winger. I really so. liked playing with Adam. He was a, he was a great guy in the locker room. Really, really good guy. <clears throat> yeah, it's really interesting just thinking about sports compared to work. You know, and, and careers in sort of the normie land, but just how many you know you think about you know the the fighter on the goon on the squad, the guy who's yeah. a great trader but does you know comes from the streets and you know the guy who's all finesse uh you know and then the guy who muscles it and the, the blocker and the tackler and then sort of the quarterback and the gm and all these things so i'd love to get into this thread and, yeah. and round out the show with this one so uh you know kind of what are some of the things you learned along the way maybe we'll start with you know small things first well i mean yeah like i think that the the point of that is that you you build on all the small moments and you and you and you you don't just build on them but you kind of you you celebrate them right so it's not just that you're you're uh doing the little things all the time and it, it does matter doing the little things matters and they they do add up but also celebrating those things because they do lead to the bigger things and um uh, one of the guys that that uh, I follow, Sahil Bloom, he likes to say that he likes to say you 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 um, increase your your surface luck area, right? So uh, your luck surface area by doing all these things, doing all these small things, you can increase that area. And it's kind of the same thought: is that eventually something it adds up, and something and something does break your way, and so it's 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 a, attention to those little details. It's not. It's not being, um, you know, anal retentive or it's not being overly uh, not to have like dogma around it, but it's more like do these little things and do them right because they do matter. There, There are certain things that do matter and they will add up and make a difference. Oh, yeah. And, you know, moving on to sort of ego is the enemy. I can't imagine, you know, sports and also Wall Street hedge funds. I mean, egos must be very large in a lot of these situations. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I always uh, I, I grew up uh, playing a lot of sports like yourself. I played even, you know, street hockey, not on skates, but, you know, with a street puck or a street ball uh, or a tennis ball even. But um, one of the things that I, my favorite sport was soccer. 
And I would always pick up with different people. And you could tell, you know, like in hockey, you have a puck hog or a ball hog in basketball or anything. A guy won't pass it to you. And I would always try to earn credibility by being someone who could set someone up for an easy score. You pass it to me. And instead of me trying to do what I can do and show off, I'm going to get it back yeah. to you and, and set you up. And then I know you're going to pass to me in the future. I'm going to set you up more and more. And we're going to have a nice time. And we could develop camaraderie very quickly that way by being generous. Yeah. yeah, um, of course, yeah. And, and, and not bringing the ego to the table. At the same time, you know, you kind of have to be confident uh, in your abilities. And, and sometimes there are alpha games on the field, whether it's in training or practice before your teammates uh, in, in a common goal. Yeah, I mean, well, I heard I, I you're 100% correct. And I learned this kind of the hard way uh, in college. So when I when I went to Yale, I was uh, I'd been a defenseman in high school. And then I when I got to Yale, I they moved me up to right wing, because I, I had a lot of speed. And so um, that was my that was probably my, my my greatest talent is just having being fast. And so um, but I remember a number of times where I would get that puck. And I would go down that, go down that wing and I'd just take off. And, uh, and I, cause I knew I had the confidence that I could beat that defender and get in and get a good shot on goal. Well, that's great. But, you know, there were a number of times where I was just so focused on that, that I hadn't, you know, thought about what you just said, which is, Hey, if I, if I use my speed, I can actually use that to my advantage to get somebody else in a better position. And it took it, and yeah, it was a it was a painful lesson for me to learn. Oh, okay, yeah, I did. I'm sorry. I just, yeah. So my ego kind of got in the way. And but in Wall Street, good God, <clears throat> the egos. I mean, all the way up until the 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 um me leaving my official posts on, uh, you know, before I became a reformed hedge fund manager, uh, the egos were just gargantuan, sickening, stomach turning, stomach turning. And so I just don't want to ever be like that. You know, I'll be on, uh, I'll, you know, you've got a great podcast here. I've been on tiny podcasts. I've been on huge ones. I've been on, you know, news uh, channels. I don't care. I don't care, you know, if you're, if we're in the same, we're all trying to do the same thing here. Doesn't matter to me. So, um, my, I, my ego has been demolished over the, over the course of, of the, my athletic and, and, uh, wall street career. That just doesn't matter. Yeah. No, I, I mean, ego is a very, uh, touchy subject or a hard thing to deal with in the workplace, uh, how much to express of your own ego and be confident and, and how much to kind of balance, you know, but having confidence is good. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, that's, and that's different being, you know, having confidence is good, but letting your ego get in the way and mm. thinking, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, do that task because I'm above that. That's ridiculous. You right. Know? Like, yeah. That's you go on to say like, you know, if Coates wants you on the penalty kill instead of the power play, so be it. Barker complain, and, and you're yeah. likely to find yourself on the bench instead. And exactly. I, I definitely run into that a little bit at work where, you know, uh, you know, maybe you don't you don't want to handle a problem. But, you know, people like problem solvers more than, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Then the misery loves problem company. Uh, yeah, you want to mention, you know, how luck is created. And I think we saw that through our conversation with your career. And uh, also comfort zones. If you aren't losing it, then, you know, if you aren't losing, you aren't in the right league. So surrounding yourself with, with better players uh, until you're the best. Uh, yeah. And, you know, um, the, the being, getting out of your comfort zone is that is definitely that's a that's a tough one for people to learn. But when it's easy, when you're when you're um, <laughs> when you're 18 year old kid and you're step onto the ice and you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of people watching you. Um, suddenly you're, you're not in your comfort zone, you know, so that prepares you to then step on the ice with the Mark Messier, who you've been watching as a kid, you're outside your comfort zone, you know, um, but it makes you better. And then you step out of there and you're on the floor of the New York stock exchange and you're outside your comfort zone, but you're used to it. Then suddenly you're on this trading desk in a big hedge fund and you've got to execute some trades and they're big. But you're out and you're outside your comfort zone, but you're used to it. And so just you're continuously just moving into these comfort, you know, outside your comfort zone. And that's it's OK. It's good. That's how you grow. Yeah. You know, it, it makes me think a lot about um, high school. I mean, I played soccer 
and a lot of my teammates who, and I was one of the better soccer players, if not the best, but at least on my high school team or something like that. There's but a lot of my teammates uh, who I consider myself better than they were star players on the lacrosse team. And they encouraged me to come out for the lacrosse team later in my high school career. And I just felt like, hey, my ego couldn't take it. I didn't want to go out there and be the worst player on that team and work my way up. And I regret that in a lot of ways. Uh, and there was a lot more scholarship money on Long Island for lacrosse than there was for soccer. Uh, and I think there was a lot of similar you know, traits and abilities I, I could have picked up. But, you know, and I think a lot of these things really relate to sort of Bitcoin and thinking about Bitcoin as a game, you know, in yeah. the game of life. And so, you know, leaving your comfort zone, you talk about leadership and how leadership is something you earned, not demand. And it can, comes from gaining trust from your teammates. But uh, you also talk about finding your North Star. And I think about Bitcoin as, as a North Star. And you talk about attitudes equals outcomes and read, react, adjust. So, you know, do your own research. Uh, don't trust, verify. Um, all eyes on you. Uh, all eyes are always on Bitcoin in a lot of ways. Uh, at least mm -hmm. the people that are in the know, if you know. Uh, not everyone's looking at Bitcoin, obviously. that That is the value play here. Uh, but, you know, key eyes are on Bitcoin in terms of the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, and sure. uh, other yeah. players. Um, keep a healthy perspective, you know, it's kind of, uh, it's going to be a long ride, a long journey. Uh, you will soar, you will crash. I mean, this is very Bitcoin like, uh, yeah. you know, but sports games, just like money is not always life or death. And I'm, I'm not talking about the money you need to eat, but sort of, you know, your successes and your riches and your highs and lows and in work. And we see that a lot now, especially in real estate, Twitter and, and other uh, anecdotal information about suicides going up and people dealing with career pressure and financial pressure. Yeah. Um, you talk about rising tides. Ever notice how some players seem to improve because of those around them? And we talked a lot about that in sports and making, you know, other yeah, people I mean, around them. My, my, my first boss, he basically said, look, um, we'll give you a piece of advice. Never be the smartest one in the room. Always surround yourself with people who are smarter than you and you'll do just fine. You know, um, not only will they keep you out of trouble, typically, but you'll learn so much from them you know, and, uh, exactly what we talked about. Yeah. And you talk about determined focus. Uh, that's key keeping, you know, sort of, uh, keeping your eye on the ball, uh, as a hitter. Um, but we've also talked about in hockey with like Wayne Gretzky's famous for skating where the puck's going to go, which is kind of like the Bitcoin play, uh, mm -hmm. with, with purchasing power and the asymmetric bet talk about time management. I mean, that's obviously in play here, uh, to be a successful student athlete at Yale, you have to manage your time to have a successful career as a hedge fund trader. Uh, just all the responsibilities uh, in life. I, I know your your you know husband yeah. and, and different things like that. That's kind of obvious. Be a good listener. Um, you know, we've definitely kind of demonstrated that here. We're listening to each other and we're taking in the information and we're trying to learn. Uh, be a good communicator. You're very articulate. Um, but you know, we can see how that really helps in in life. And you know, when you do speak, make it count, add value or insight, not fluff or noise. If you don't agree with a leader, tell them in private, never in a group. This these are this is really good advice. Um, this is kind of like Bitcoin advice in terms of like orange pilling people. Like you know, you never really want to call them out in front of people or yeah, make it about doing... their morals or values. You know, careful um, at the Thanksgiving table, <laughs> right? Uh, find a mentor, be a mentor. That's kind of what this show is about, you know, kind of finding your Morpheus or, you know, on your Neo journey. Uh, mm -hmm. so when you're a rookie or, you know, an elder can be an invaluable teacher. And as you grow and learn, they guide you, push you, keep you out of trouble. Then when you're a senior player, it's time to pay the favor forward, uh, find a mentor, be a mentor circle of life. And you also talk about the long game, uh, which, you know, as in anything in finance, economics, accounting and Bitcoin, uh, it's very important to have a, a, you know, long or low time preference uh, perspective. Low time. This might be my favorite one because, you know, um, I've seen so many people get frustrated and and I, I've been frustrated before about things that just don't come quickly enough. Man, I, man, I like things to happen quickly, but um, over the years, I've gotten a lot more patience. And so it's really important to have patience and just that discipline it's it is a it's a long journey both in in bitcoin and your career whatever it may be um and uh you don't know when something big is right around the corner just keep going just keep going just keep going just keep going and uh as long as you're enjoying the journey that's what matters because if you're only you know if you're only looking for if you keep saying that well, i'll be happy when 
then when you get that, you'll, you'll, again, you'll set a new goal. I'll be happy when, and then you're not enjoying the entire journey. And then what is the purpose? And that sounds f- deeply or surface philosoph- philosophy, but I mean, really like, what are you, what are you, what are you doing if you're only constantly chasing something and not happy with where you are, because you're always going to be where you are, not where you want to be, where you're striving to be. You're never going to be where you're striving to be because the moment you get there, you're striving to be somewhere else. So you might as well enjoy the journey all along the way. And man, I'll tell you what, I can remember being in a tiny apartment in New York, not having enough money to buy two suits, not having enough money to eat out. And I can still look back on those days and still think about what an amazing time that was and how incredible it was, even though I was struggling financially, you know, even though we were like, it was just, just a kid just trying to find my way still you know so yeah there there there's some i think there's some there's definitely some nuggets in there athletes we will certainly resonate with a lot of athletes that they've learned these lessons along the way and you can apply them in your career for sure it's uh you know it's what you make of it right yeah well that's awesome so my final question for you then and i ask this kind of like coming from two different places so i think a lot of people you know uh, men or women that are trying to maybe orange pill their spouse. So mm-hmm. maybe there's a husband out there and he's a plumber or uh, an electrician or whatever it might be. And uh, they want to orange pill their spouse. But, you know, maybe their spouse, you don't know anything about money. That's not your lane. You're telling me, you know, and maybe that's a struggle. And I think also, you know, so so you're a hedge fund manager. So it's more your lane just in terms of if someone doesn't know anything about money or Bitcoin or currency. And I think also that, but then there also might be the pushback of, hey, babe, uh, you know, is this another one of these fancy arbitrage deals you're trying to do or another newfangled product or another way to, you know, sort of rich, quick scheme, yeah, whatever it might be, another trade. Um, So there might be its own difficulty there. Um, But have you orange pilled your wife? And and maybe what has that been like? Oh, yeah, it was easy because I was sitting there. she knew I was, I was watching all these videos and she's like, what did you know? Okay. Bitcoin. Okay. And then, um, she's a, she self-proclaimed allergic to math. Um, she's an author, really good author. Uh, I should, you know, give her her due. She's a New York times bestseller. So she's not, she's very smart, but she doesn't love math. She likes words. So anyways, I'm sitting there one day and, uh, some of your listeners already know this, but, um, I was watching an interview between uh, Jeff Booth and Pomp, and he was explaining to Pomp the uh, the inflationary deflationary forces of of uh, what's going on in technology versus uh, you know the manipulation of, of central bank um, currency, uh, manipulate currency. And so uh, I, I paused it. And I was supposed to be helping her with dinner. I said, "Hey, you got to come look at this." And I grabbed my laptop. We sat on the edge of the bed and we watched the whole thing an hour. And, uh, and, you know, I mean, it clicked with me. I got it. And she, and and she looked at me at the end of it. She goes, do we own enough? (laughs) So it was, she, I had been talking about it for quite a bit. Um, but then Jeff put it in terms that just, okay, that makes, now it makes, it makes sense. I get it. Okay. This makes sense. So he did part of the work for me. So thank you, Jeff. But um, she knows because I talk about the money and how the money's broken. And so it was easy for her to, for when I explained how Bitcoin is structured and, you know, it was like, oh God, yeah, I get it. Okay. Okay. And to be quite honest, Cedric, she's the one who uh, tried to get me to look at Bitcoin back in like 2015. 20 in 2017 she had heard uh, on a podcast um and i want to say it was tim ferris but uh they were talking about this thing bitcoin she's like hey honey i think you should look at the, the, this thing called bitcoin these guys are talking about it and like it's going to be the next big thing i was like honey let me do with the finances you go write your words and books i'll deal with the finances don't you worry and what an idiot i didn't listen so my my wife is really easy to orange pill. She she tried to orange pill me, in fact. So <laughs> I'm not a particularly religious person, but there's an expression, uh, you know, your your 
God is speaking through to you through your wife. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, um, I'm an idiot. So, so uh, <laughs> before we roll out, uh, you know, you are working at the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund. And I think, you know, listeners would love to hear a little bit about this before we roll out. So, yeah, please let us yeah. know where they can find you, your work and and tell us a little bit about the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund, because I, I think it's an exciting uh, opportunity for people, you know, to get involved in the Bitcoin space. Yeah, of course. So uh, I started the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund, um, co-managing partner with David Foley, who is Larry Lepard's uh, partner in his hedge fund. And so Dave and I uh, are the, we, we work on the fund daily. We've got other partners that people will know and, and have heard of Larry Lepard, Greg Foss, Mark Moss, uh, uh, Corey Clipson. Um, and so they're, they act more as a, kind of like an advisory board. So when we are working through uh, issues on a, on a private equity investment or something, they're, they're in, on a board we meet with each week. Um so it's for accredited investors, not my rule, SEC, there's nothing to do about it. But if you're an accredited investor, what we do is we invest in the Bitcoin ecosystem. We do public and private, early stage, late stage. We can do venture. We can do, uh, we, well, because we have a, a public private partnership, it's a hybrid. We, what we've done is we've layered uh, some um, risk management tools on top of our investments across the entire portfolio, you know, doing things like uh, put spreads on the on the portfolio or volatility trades on some of the Bitcoin related investments that we have. And that that is we're looking to dampen the volatility of the entire portfolio because it is in the Bitcoin ecosystem <clears throat> and uh, protect downside. So, uh, but yeah, if you if you are interested in that, we're super excited. Uh, we we're already making investments. We we have uh, raised uh, a, a bunch of capital, and we're we're still open for investment uh, through the end of the year. So, if you are interested, we have a, a few more slots open. We're limited to ninety nine. Again, not my rule; it's the SEC rule. Uh, but you can find out more opportunity. Just go to bitcoinopportunity.fund. Email us and we'll and we'll get you um, a packet. You just have to check off the boxes that that uh, that um, validate you as a, an accredited investor. And so we're happy to do that. So um, and you can find me on Twitter, uh, just James at James Lavish. Um, and um, I've got a lot of of podcasts I've been on. You can search YouTube. Uh, and then my newsletter that I put out every single week is called The Informationist. You can find a link to that uh, in my Twitter bio, or you can just go to jameslavish.com and sign up for that. It's totally free. And once a week, I take one complicated financial topic and I break it down super simply, like the bond auction or uh, the reverse repo market, things like that. Make it really easy for you to understand what's going on in the, in the actual plumbing of, of the world of finance. And, and it helps, I think, people uh, manage their own investments and, and see how they're doing and, and how to kind of navigate the uncertainty that that's ahead of us. So, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's got, it's grew really fast. It's got almost 25,000 subscribers now. Um, so, uh, and I love doing it. I sit down every Saturday morning and I script something out and it goes out every Sunday. So. Awesome. Yeah. It's, a, it's an incredible piece of work that you've been putting out all the content. Thank so thank you, James. This has been so dope. Thank you so much. It's been awesome. Thank you for having me, Cedric. And I look forward to the next time. You got Thank it. You. Hey, hey, that's a wrap on today's episode of the Bitcoin Matrix podcast with reformed hedge fund manager, James Lavish. I hope that you found it as fun, informative and enlightening as I did. Hit us up. We'd love to hear your feedback. I want to thank you for tuning in. Please keep in mind that I only work with the best sponsors and that they are a big reason I can deliver this content for free. So I hope that you will support our sponsors, Alpa for energy bars, River to build your Bitcoin wealth, Thea for multi-sig that's super mobile friendly and secure, Hodler's official for the dopest team Bitcoin merch, Florida Beef Initiative for succulent grass-fed steaks. And you can also find me at The Bitcoin Advisor, where I am a phone call away to help you with all your Bitcoin needs. Also, you can support me and the show directly on the Found app and with tips on Twitter. Finally, if you could write a five-star review for the Bitcoin Matrix podcast wherever you listen to your pods, that would really help get the word out and help new listeners find us when they search for new content. Keep building, keep stacking, always stay laser-focused out there, and let's work to find a way to free Ross. 
This is Cedric. Peace. Peace.